Yay! Every year, Lisa, myself, and the rest of the reviews team roll up our sleeves and test hundreds of products for you, the good people at home. This year, we tested an especially interesting slate of kitchen gear, ranging from spice organizers to soda machines to smart ovens and more. What better way to cap off a year of testing than to share our favorite gear from 2021? Lisa and I have the full rundown just for you. First up, Hannah. All right, if you're a cook, you know that spice storage can be a total problem. This is a very personal problem to me. My spice <laughs> storage was a hot mess. It was a hot mess. It was just a jumble, you know, like digging around back there, missing spices. I found four bottles of cumin in my cabinet. There are all different devices that do this. Some hang over doors, some go in drawers, some go in cabinets, like this expandable model right here. It really depends on what space you're trying to fill. So we tested all different ones, and we found winners in each category, over the door, in the drawer, in the cabinet. All right, so what do we look for in these things? First of all, they needed to be reasonably easy to put together. You know, we don't want it to be this huge chore. You're already reorganizing your spice cabinet, which is a chore in itself. We don't want to make this a multi-day affair. They also needed to be sturdy, you know, to, sturdy enough to hold heavy glass bottles full of spices. Some models clustered bottles together too closely. It was hard to read their labels. Visibility was really key. We needed enough room to see everything. You want to be able to see the labels so you know what you have. You want to be able to grab things quickly while you're cooking. We also looked at capacity, how many bottles they could fit. You really want to be able to have a little bit of breathing room in your spice cabinet so you can add more spices as you learn about them. All right, so I tried our top two winners in my cabinets, and the spicy shelf was my top pick. It hugs the back of the cabinet, it hugs the walls, and it's expandable to all different configurations and sizes. It took me a minute to figure out what worked best for me. I tried this one as well, the M design with the stadium seating here. It was so easy to set up. The spicy shelf requires some setup. This, you just put it in and expand it to the space. Super easy. I will say though, because the bottles stand in the stadium seating here, sometimes the labels are blocked. For me, I didn't mind doing a little bit of setup to get that better visibility. All right, so I, what I really loved about these is that they solve a problem. My spice cabinet was a total hot mess. Now it's beautiful beautifully organized. I feel like I'm gonna cook more flavorful food, I'm gonna save money because I won't be double buying spices, and I'll be more inspired because I can really see what's in there. Okay, like, ooh, I just saw some Cajun seasoning, I have some fish, like that sounds absolutely delicious. They can make you a more inspired and more organized cook. Next up, the solo stove. I tested this this year and I have to say, I first started seeing it crop up on Instagram, the stainless steel fire pit. And some of my friends were posting about them and I thought, okay, like another status symbol brand. I'm here to say I was wrong. Honestly, I got one and I am converted. I am obsessed with it. Why I love it over regular fire pits, they've created vents at the top and the bottom that really does allow airflow that makes the fire smoke less. If you have the fire going correctly, these do not smoke. You could actually sit like two inches from it if you're really cold. So I love that. The second thing is they are so portable. That stainless steel design means they're really light. And because they're a barrel like this, you can carry them around. They come with a carrying bag. I packed mine up, took it to Maine this summer. I tested this cooking apparatus that goes on top of it. So basically a little crown sits on top and then a cast iron cooking grate goes above the crown. The crown raises the grate up a little bit from the fire. So I have made so many different foods on this things. Burgers, hot dogs, sausage, fish, artichokes, tomatoes, green beans, zucchini. Earlier today, I made one of my favorite complete meals on there. Steak, broccoli, and little tiny potatoes. It's so delicious. That's actually the first thing I would recommend if you're playing around, you know, cook some hot dogs and little tiny potatoes. The key to cooking on a solo stove or live fire in general is you want the fire to be going for a while because you want a lot of hot coals. You don't want to cook your food over a raging flame. You know, you can use flames strategically to sear things, but hot coals are your friends. They're more powerful in heat, but they're less aggressive in that flame, so they're not like scorch the bottom. But you know, frankly, you have to accept that you're gonna burn something to a crisp if you are cooking over live fire for the first time. I think uh, I definitely have burned several things. And honestly, the food you can cook on it is absolutely delicious. So if you need a new fire pit or you're interested in dipping a toe in live fire cooking, the Solo Stove is fantastic. If you love seltzer at home like I do, it can be great to buy a dedicated machine because you're not lugging home cans from the store. You can reduce your carbon footprint and you can save money in the long run. Now we tested all different machines. There were two different styles. One of them required these tall, slim CO2 canisters 
And the second relied on acid and sodium bicarbonate powders. And we had a strong preference for this style that uses CO2 canisters. The powders, they just didn't get the water bubbly enough. They didn't work. They also took forever. Models that use CO2 were much more successful at making bubbly water in a nice range. All right, so there were two different bottle materials in our spread of machines. Most of them had plastic, one had glass. And there are pros and cons to each. The plastic bottles, they can't go in the dishwasher. The one machine that had glass bottles, its bottles are a little heavier, a little smaller, but they can go in the dishwasher and they don't degrade in the same way that plastic does over time. The most stylish option was the Arc. This is the one I purchased. I just think it's really nice looking and if I have to look at it all day in my kitchen, I want it to be pretty. All right, so let's make some seltzer. I'm gonna show this. I really wanted something that attached easily. That was key and it was not a given. You also want something sturdy. You know, you're putting, <laughs> there's carbonation here. There's, there's actually like force going into the bottle. You don't want something that feels flimsy. Now I just push down this lever to my desired bubbliness. There we go. Take a sip. Mm. Deliciously bubbly. And here's a little extra tip for you. Colder water will carbonate easier. It will get bubblier. So if you want really bubbly water, make sure you're starting with super cold water. All right, so if you love seltzer water and want to reduce your carbon footprint and save on purchasing seltzer, an at-home seltzer maker is a great option. Mini muffin tins were another of my most favorite testings we did this year. They make the cutest baked good, whether you have kids or you like to entertain and you want little bite-sized desserts. I really, I was supposed to bake one thing for today, but I baked three things because I was just having so much fun. We tested a whole bunch of pans. Some of them were steel, some were silicone, and this turned out to be the most important factor. Steel was the way to go. Nice, deep, even browning. Aluminum and silicone were both spotty. So that was the most important thing. And pan color, like you might have remembered from previous baking gearheads episodes, pan color is also a factor. We loved, you know, golden brown or darker pans because then you get nice browning on your crust. Nonstick coating, that was another thing that was really important. You, there's a lot of little holes to clean here. You really want food to come off easily so you're not in there scrubbing 24 or 36 individual little cups. So nonstick coating and nice nonstick coating for great release was also important. Another thing was a generous rim. So rim is what goes around the pan. And if you see both of these pans have some extra space right here. And that just makes handling so much easier, especially if you're pulling these out of a hot oven, you have bulky oven mitts on, it gives you a place to land your fingers that's not boop right into one of your cute little baked goods that will no longer be cute if your thumb goes into it. One question we get all the time with these is how do you adapt a regular size muffin recipe or cupcake recipe to these mini muffin cupcake tins? So we came up with two rules of thumb. First of all, fill the cups roughly a half to three quarters full. This will leave enough room for them to rise and they don't overflow and bleed into each other. The second is to start checking them earlier because the smaller cups have a smaller mass, the heat is gonna penetrate it quicker, so they will be done faster. Our Best Buy is the Wilton Perfect Results Premium Nonstick. It did a great job. The only difference was it was slightly, slightly less beautifully, gorgeously golden browning, but still a great job and at a fraction of the price. Our winner is from Williams Sonoma here, the Gold Touch Pan. It just surpassed the Wilton just for its beautiful browning. Both of these pans are a great choice for making delicious, cute, cute treats. All right, so I'm gonna eat one of these. I'm gonna go classic. Uh, nice and vanilla. But now we're gonna tune in to Lisa and see what her favorite picks from our 2021 testing lineup were. So the first thing I wanna talk about today is rice cookers. Yes, you can cook rice on the stove in a pan or even in the oven, but the beauty of the rice cooker is you just dump the rice and water in, you push a button, and it cooks the rice perfectly for you and it holds it at the perfect food safe, steamy, moist temperature for hours. It's not fast, but in our testing, we found that slower, longer rice cycles actually work better because the grains have time to absorb the water and to heat up evenly. And so you get perfectly evenly cooked rice. And this really showed up when we cooked brown rice. I have thrown brown rice in my rice cooker here, hit the brown rice button, I get perfect brown rice. I don't have to think about it, I don't have to worry about it, it just cooks. This is our favorite. It's a Zojirushi Neuro Fuzzy Rice Cooker. They're pretty simple actually. Inside is a cooking pot and underneath that is a heating element. The cooking pot is nonstick coated in this case and it has markings inside telling you, you know, what level of water to add, whether you're doing white rice, brown rice, 
sweet rice, semi-brown rice, anything you want to do in here. And then this just sits in the chamber. You close it up and the water is heated by that heating element. It's an enclosed space. It might soak the rice a while and then it gently cooks it. Steam escapes through this vent and it will alert you when it's done and then switch over to keep warm. It comes with two measuring cups, one for brown rice, one for white rice. They have measurements on them that are related to this rice cooker. So hang on to these. I just store mine you know, right in here in between uses. I have white rice here. This is sushi rice. I'm just gonna do two cups today. You definitely wanna wash your rice. You know, not only does that remove any surface dirt, if there's anything left over from harvesting and milling, but it also takes off a little bit of the excess starch. And some of that starch is what often either bubbles up and clogs the vents or will burn on the bottom of a rice cooker. I just take the whole bowl and I bring this over to the sink and I fill it up a few times, swish the rice around and pour off as much of the water as I can without letting the rice escape. I do it about four times. It does not have to run perfectly clear, but you'll see first couple rounds, it's very white and cloudy water and then it begins to get clearer. Got my rice scooper and, and fluffer at the ready. Beautiful steam, gorgeous rice. It's the best because it makes perfect rice every time. So next up, my favorite grill pan. A lot of grill pans that you see are shaped like a skillet with ridges. And these are designed so that you can cook food up on top of the ridges. You get flavorful char marks that look like you were grilling outside. A lot of times people talk about grill pans being a problem because they smoke up the kitchen and they splatter and they're a mess to clean. I have a few tips for cooking. And I also have to tell you that the design of this pan makes it so much easier to use and clean than a lot of grill pans out there. First of all, we really like the cast iron grill pan as opposed to ones that are made of aluminum or steel or have nonstick coating. Those are pressed out of a sheet of metal and they can never press the grill ridges high enough to make them really distinct. And the whole point of this type of pan is a really crisp, distinct grill mark and to lift the food up out of the fat if that's what you're trying to do. The cast iron can be cast to have a nice, tall, high, distinct grill ridges and it can get nice and hot and retain a lot of heat so it radiates heat and you get a beautiful char mark. You're not waiting and waiting for that nonstick pan to get hot and then you really wanna get nonstick that hot. This is just like your favorite cast iron skillet. It's indestructible. Now as for smoking up your house and making a big mess with a grill pan, I have found that if you preheat them on medium heat for at least four minutes before you put any food in, get the pan good and hot, and then you wanna put the oil on the food, not in the pan. Oil or fat that is not covered by food is what causes the smoke to come up and fill up your house with smoke. I don't like to buy stuff I don't need. And I thought, why do I need a grill pan? But as I was testing these, some of them I did not fall in love with, but this one I really did, and I went out and bought it right at the end of testing. This is my own copy of this pan, and we use it a lot. This is the Lodge, and it's the Chef Collection. This design with these nice wide ridges, food is not gonna get trapped in there. It's very easy to rinse off and to clean. Plus, this is really easy to store, and the two handles makes it easier to handle, because these are heavy pans. The heaviness of the cast iron is part of its charm. It's gonna hold a bunch of heat and then radiate it toward your food for great browning. Okay, so we're gonna make a panini, and you'll see how it works. It's great. You can really make a beautiful sandwich. Treat yourself, it's great. This pan is wonderful. So the next thing I wanna talk about is something that's really simple, but honestly, a good wooden spoon makes the difference. My favorite was this one from Jonathan Spoons. It's got a shallow bowl that's nice for scooping things. It's got a narrow front edge, so it's good for scraping. It's got this little rest on it so that you can put it on the edge of a pot if you want to. It also gives you a good place to grab. So it's a very comfortable spoon. This is handmade um, from a small company. We also have this one and it's called the Fay Teak Wooden Spoon. It's about half the price. It's got a thin front edge. It's good for scraping. It's got a really neutral handle 
so that a lot of different people can find a comfortable grip in a bunch of different positions. And both of them are long enough to reach into deeper pots without having to really have your hand down there or to feel like you're, you know, stirring from way up here. So, you know, for cleaning them, we wash them by hand after every test. And we also put them in the dishwasher because some people told us that's what they do. And honestly, you don't want to do that. It really does parch out the wood. And the more you put it in that harsh environment, that's long, you know, 40 minutes or however long your dishwasher cycle is, that wood is a natural substance. It will dry out, it will swell up. And then as it dries, it will crack and you'll lose this finish. It will turn gray like a Nantucket cottage. You know, and that's lovely in Nantucket, but not so great for your spoon. You really want to keep the spoon in good shape. You want to wash it by hand. You want to pat it dry. And if it gets a little parched looking, touch it up with mineral oil, which you can get from any hardware store. Or you can look at our website. We have a recipe for DIY spoon butter, which combines mineral oil and beeswax. And that really prolongs the life of the tool, whether it's a wooden spoon or a cutting board or anything else made of wood. So these are my favorites and we have been using them in the test kitchen and really love them. So last but definitely not least is the June Smart Oven. This oven is one of five smart ovens that I tested this year and I fell in love with this thing to the point where I just bought one myself. It works like a toaster oven. It can slow cook, it can dehydrate, it can air fry. I did all those things in it and more. Basically it has a camera inside so it can recognize food it's called the food ID feature, and that's part of the intelligence of the June oven. It has a probe attachment where you can put that right into the food and it will track the temperature. It will track on your phone the temperature of the oven and the food. The base price of this is about $600. And then, you know, as you go up, there's three packages. It adds other accessories like a pizza stone, air fryer baskets. You can also purchase those separately. So it is a little expensive. We do have an alternative as a Best Buy. We have the Tovala oven, which is about half the price of this. It also has its own meal kit service that's optional, but the meal kits were actually pretty good. So it was kind of surprising. Let's cook something in the June and you'll see for yourself how easy it is. That's it. It has this great big window and it's a clear window, but you also get it on your phone. So here, on the app, it shows me the camera at the top of the oven, live video of that shrimp cooking. It shows me right now it's using only the top burners. The temperature of the oven and the food are both graphed on here. So you see it in a visual, you see it in numbers, you see it in words. Some of the other ones we tested were super confusing, super irritating, whether it was the app or the box itself. I just, it drove me up the wall. Honestly, you never knew what it was really doing and you always feared that you'd forgot to hit a button and it was stopped and it wasn't gonna happen. And you don't want that. The smart oven is supposed to take the stress off. This one does, the Tovala does, the other ones did not. This oven was really great for anyone who really loves to cook, but also someone maybe who doesn't know as much about cooking because it can help you. It has everything built into it. So it makes it very, very simple to work. Whether you use it as a manual oven or using its smart features to give you a little assist, it's a great product that really works. Thanks for tuning in. That's a wrap on season three for GearHeads. Stay tuned for season four coming soon. For more information on all the products we talked about today, check out the links below. Make sure to ask us any of your kitchen equipment questions in the comments. Like this video and hit that subscribe button.